start with just a question about the, the world that I am now sitting in, that you've created with the designers and the dancers. Could you say a little bit something about um, how you envisioned the world that we're, the, the space that we're in? We've got you know windows of light coming in, we've got shaker style pegboards for clothing, we've got a bench, then we've got the dancing world and, and many different eras and geographies of costumes. I, I tend not to envision or project or um, I kind of work with found stuff. And I think the collaborators that I work with, the performers as well as the designers, um, we've worked together probably repeatedly and for a while because of that. So if there's an obsession or a particular kind of curiosity, we do the research around that. And then that, depending on what we actually have our hands on that day or at that period in here, it actually has been really fabulous is that we've been at the pillow. This is our third time here. You so mean in, in, in building the work that you've been in, in this building space the work. Mm -hmm. So being able to be in this space and being able to have uh, residencies with folks here and have conversations with folks. Okay, so so you weren't envisioning, but then you found a need for a pegboard. Well, we had a lot of costumes. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of costumes, and that came about because as we understand or stood it that the shakers for their day and time period had quite a bit more clothes than the average everyday Joe. Um, so with the communal living, they had, um, um, what do we call it now? We call it disposable income. They had disposable time that they could actually, because um, it was their worship and it was the whole intent of their being, they could actually take the time to do details where everybody else would just be kind of stitching. So, so may I, I mean, I, I'm delighted to see you come out in this shirt because maybe you could say something about, um, this shirt relates to some of the fabric we saw yeah, in, in the piece and with the very I, opening ritual moment. I think some of it's there and it makes appearances. It um, came about, again, found material. Um, we had, um, a performance residency in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at uh, Linden Sculpture Garden, uh, where I've been in residence a few years, and she's been bringing in a, um, a woman, Ariane King Comer, who does indigo dyeing, batik, and um, we were making this performance with community groups, and I thought it would be interesting to kind of have these large pieces of cloth. Um, to use to kind of control the crowd, move around, ball up, throw at each other, do things. And then after the performance, I was like, well, can we have this <laughs> material? And she's just like, oh yeah, take it. And um, the two designers, when I brought it back, I wasn't sure if they were gonna be interested. The, the costume it. designers? Yeah, the costume designers, Inver and now Cohen. We're extremely excited. They were just like, yeah, free material, and it's pretty, and it's, <laughs> Wax is, you know, it still has the wax in it. That's how that first piece kind of stands up. Um, so indigo is, I think, or is it close? It's a shaker color or blue. So shaker blue and indigo are in the same kind of palette. And um, it was just like, yeah, let's use it. So, so <laughs> I, I want to ask you about that because you, you've done all this research. You've done your your research at Hancock Shaker Village but you're not trying to stage an exact, you're not trying to reproduce a scene of what you think happened in Watervliet, New York when uh, Mother Rebecca was there. You're not trying to do um, a reconstruction. No. So your attention to detail of the pegboards and the indigo, how did that kind of prompt you in your own discovery? I love, I love details and I love random details and I love how people that I'm working with interact with those random details. So um, Mother Rebecca's community or communities were actually in Philadelphia. And she met the Shakers in Waterfleet, but she actually had, um, had a prayer, singing and prayer group that she had been, for lack of a better term, working with. And just the thought as after doing so much thinking and researching about uh, black shout traditions across the planet, um, 
thinking that these black folks, especially if they were in the majority, if not exclusively black and majority women, wouldn't they carry over some of that kind of physicality or practice that they already kind of had in African, Afro-Baptist, Afro-Methodist kind of worship? Mm -hmm. And so if shakers are moving and moving into spirit and Africanist traditions are shaking and moving into spirit, <laughs> yeah. So, and so that curiosity is just like, well, let's actually kind of play it out. So we actually used um, videotape from the Enfield Shaker Singers, I think that's their name, but from Enfield Shaker um, Village, and um, which is a reconstruction. So it's somebody else's already imagination of what um, Shaker dances look like, and I think probably like the eight, late 1800s. Um, we learned that and then we started experiencing that and as a company coming from different parts of African diaspora, different parts of the globe, different types of um, modern dance, contemporary practice, let's play with it. So we played with that in the studio. So that becomes the studio kind of um, exploration or research mm -hmm. versus like going to Hancock Shaker Village and learning what the Shakers um, did there, what were their rules, what were they, how were they connected to Mount Lebanon, which was the administrative center. How does it different in the Kentucky villages where they had um, quite a number of black folks also, but it wasn't its entire, it wasn't one community. Mm -hmm. um, so all those questions are just interesting questions, I guess. And so then when, when you're here um, in the studio, you know, experimenting with the, we've learned this kind of s social sacred dance form, now we're gonna bring in what we know and what kind of vibe. Then you're layering in music from very different places. Mm -hmm. um, what what um, led you away from using shaker music into, there's a Japanese folk song there, we hear Meredith Monk, we hear a bunch of different kinds of, of things. So um, try, tell me about being a DJ, I guess. Uh, um, uh, it's found material again. I love, and I'd had the, um, the Solan Bushi, which is a track on a Staple Singers album, which I had heard over and over and over again, and um, I had wondered. It's the piece that's the uh, duet the for two the two men. The duet, yeah. yeah. And um, I'd always wondered, whenever it would come up on the album, I'd be cleaning or doing something, and I would um, be like, I wonder if that's really Japanese. And um, we now go. We are actually in rehearsal here. She was over there stitching or ironing or doing something. We were either on a break and I said, oh, there's a track and I put it on. I was just like, if she turns around, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably actually Japanese because I just couldn't imagine the staple singers mm -hmm. singing a Japanese song that sounded, I was just like, is this racist? Is this awkward? <laughs> is this, what, what is going on with this? And Staple Singers being like a Delta gospel kind of group, and my family's from the Delta. And I put it on, and Naoko was there, and she kind of... <laughs> and she turned around, and she was just like, what is that? And I so we started talking, and she started telling me about her relationship to the song. It's a labor, it's a fishing work song. So this idea of labor and work started, it was just, the rhythm was interesting for us to kind of play around with the material and I thought I would never actually use it. But the more I started thinking about um, the staple singers and their work around the civil rights and about labor unions and things of 60s kind of activism, thinking about um, labor and work and the Shaker's idea of um, labor being sacred or being a way to connect with spirit. So thinking for me, thinking about different workers across the planet that just have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And um, sometimes they can find a meditative way to do it. Sometimes it's still survival. Sometimes it's against anything. But it was to me just to kind of get a bigger reach of um, what to my imagination, the Shakers being something really specific and in my imagination also really New England and very white and um, their ideas being a lot bigger than that and thinking about other manifestations and other spiritual or religious or labor investigations about utopia, about living together, about working together, about sharing in order to have a higher standard 
Did you have a math advisor on this? And the last yeah. time you were here with uh, Moses's, Moses's, you, you were uh, talking about African fractals. And I'm wondering if that has continued to be something that is, um, is bubbling for you. It, uh, once, well, that, once that door of thinking about um, mathematics in an African context, in an indigenous, quote unquote, um, context, it was just like, yeah, it's not like some foreign, it's not some European, it's not some science, it's not something injecting itself. It's core to the culture, to the systems. And um, so it's, I feel like it's going to continue to be there. Mm -hmm. And I think as dancers, and especially I think with the mathematician who I've been working with, Jesse Wolfson, um, the idea is our relationship, especially in America, with math is not so good. And in some other places, they have different systems of math, and it's just like, it's recognizing how to be able to figure out and come into relationship to um, relations, <laughs> to scale, to um, numbers. And as dancers, we're always working with numbers and counts. Even if we're not actually counting, we know how many of a cycle or something. And so um, Jesse and I had been having conversations about math and dance, and then I was working on this piece, and as we reconstructed and we're trying to get the, um, the dancers, let me not speak for, <laughs> as they were trying to get the um, patterns and the sequences and the directions and how the patterns were working out, it started to be a lot, it just seemed like there was math mm -hmm. really at the core of these designs. And seeing, and we started talking about we have a computer, person on the, and so like thinking about the X and Y axis and then like thinking about uh, separation of um, the genders, thinking about genderized work and thinking about, because we did it together. And then I was just like, I was kind of fighting, not um, separating the men and the women in the company. And then I was just like, but it's a really interesting opportunity to kind of see the math of it, um, as well as with the costumes, thinking and projecting into cultures and thinking into histories. So it's all just there kinesthetically in front of you, hopefully pretty straightforward. <laughs>